Um, right, so yeah, you grew up on a tiny little island, well, fairly small, reunion, uh, which is what, just east of Madagascar, so a bit in the middle of nowhere for a lot of people, I think. Um, but how was, like, when, how was growing up there in terms of, like, doing outdoorsy things, or, like, did, were you, like, as a child, did you, uh, did your parents encourage you to go outside? Or? So, yeah, Reen Island is an island, just like the UK. There's a few small differences. Uh, <laughs> it's tropical, and it's only 100 kilometers north to south, and it's a mountain. Yeah. It's actually a volcano who came out of the water, and it goes until higher than Ben Nevis. Really? <laughs> yeah, 3,069 meters high. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, so even if this is a tropical island, it's actually all about the mountains. But um, my parents were not climbers at all. They were maybe Sunday hikers. But um, I remember them walking with a big cooler yeah. for the picnic. So I guess our walks were not very long. But um, so I was sailing a lot. My parents were sea people. So sailing, scuba diving, um, snow, um, not surfing, but with the boards. Yeah. And then, and then horse riding, uh, tennis, dance, yeah. So I had a sort of parents who would bring me to an activity every night. Yeah. So yes, I had a really active childhood, but um, they did present me with everything possible until I found climbing alone at school. Okay, so how did that come about? <laughs> um, climbing in, in France, it's one of the main school sports. Right, okay. Yeah, so on the side of my school, there was a, you know, just the buildings where you have the class and on the side just holds. Oh, right. It's, I mean, it's a really bad wall, yeah. but for a beginner, I was craving to have a go at these routes and, uh, and that's how I started. So I was 12 and um, mm -hmm. first I just did the two hours, four to six on the Monday, I still remember. And then there was another course on the first day. So I could do the four to six, and then the teacher was really motivated teacher. She brought us outside really quickly, like two little crags all around the island. She would take like a bunch of like 20 kids, a bus, and like, this is mad. I mean, honestly, in terms of responsibility for one teacher to handle 20 kids, thanks to her, because she made my life different. And so she showed me that climbing could be, you know, going out, going camping, touching the rock, discovering, you know, birds, especially on Marine Island, you know, the, ac the access is amazing all the time. Yeah. Camping in a, it's called Silaos, it's like a circus with, yeah, tropical, tropical flowers everywhere, a waterfall. So I've got amazing memories from my first year of climbing, you yeah. know. Sounds like a horrible place to grow up. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Don't go there ever, you shouldn't. <laughs> You'll never go back to the UK. <laughs> Yeah, it's a slightly different weather, I'm sure. I mean, I wouldn't... You guys have amazing rock. Yeah. I mean, in terms of... You call it God's own rock. And uh, the more time passes, the more I've got to say yes. I mean, if only there were more of this great stone all over the world. Yeah. But there isn't. It's unique, isn't it? <coughs> um, so, you obviously did pretty well in uh, like lead, lead competitions. Um, when so how did, how did you go from like school climbing into, into like competitive climbing then? Um, I was a really competitive kid, so when I told you sailing, uh, tennis, dancing, uh, everything was in competitions. Um, I don't know if it's Rain Island being like that or... So I, I, I came back actually to the island as a grown-up and straight away the kids jump on me and they show me their medals. Really? So I think there is kind of a competitive spirit on the island. Um, so as soon as I started climbing, I started competing. My first competition, it was top rope and it, it was a 5C+. Plus. And I fell of it, but I came second, because that was already good. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's a 5C+, plus, so clearly the level wasn't very high. Um, but then I won the, the reunion championship and then I don't really know how this happened. I, I won the French Youth Championship yeah. and I got really lucky. This year, the French Federation was inviting all the French winners to go to see a World Cup. They didn't expect that one of them was going to come from 12,000 kilometers and they were going to have to pay a flight ticket. Oh, right. <laughs> but, 
they had promised. So they sent me, they flew me back for the World Cup of Nantes. And I remember, you know, I was just 16. I had my little camera. I was alone. I didn't know anybody. And uh, I can, you know, just remember it. It brings sparkles in my head, you know. It was this big, so many people, maybe 10,000 10, people in a big arena. A massive wall, everything in the dark and the lights. And it was Yuji Hirayama, one. And the girl, Liv Sansos. And I was six, no, I was just 15. And uh, I decided I wanted to be part of the stars. I wanted to be part of this world. It, it just, it really made me dream, you know? So on the flight back, alone again, 12 hours of flight, I, I still remember, I, I, uh, I was writing in my notebook and I decided I wanted to uh, leave my parents and go train in the, in the youth training center because we're in, it, didn't, it was too far, it didn't have the climbing facilities. So I came back and I told my parents, I'm going. And incredibly, they let me go. I mean, I was a good kid at school and they trust me, but I mean, for a parent to leave your 16-year-old kid to go 12,000 kilometers away, So that was the end of my childhood when I left, realistically, because uh, I then saw them once a year. But yeah, they, I mean, I'll never regret that because it gave me a life. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a big decision to make at that age though, isn't it? The, the right one, clearly. <laughs> But yeah, it's really quite funny. Right I time. never had any doubt in yeah. that one. That's good. that's good. So was there anyone, like, when you were growing up or when you were competing or even throughout like your climbing career, like is there any like key individuals that you feel like have had a big impact on how you view climbing or like, You mean in terms of heroes? Or, yeah, yeah, that sort of thing. I am um, not necessarily is... climbers or just family and Well they were I am super thankful for some people who were uh, my first coach, you know? Yeah. He was I was 12, he was 18, but uh, somehow he ended up being the volunteer coach of all the youth team. Right. So he was not being paid or anything. He just, he had no idea how to train us. I remember us doing like <laughs> millions of pull-ups and push-ups. Right, okay. But, but somehow he just had all this energy to make the group train together. And um, you don't, yeah, maybe you just don't need to read the books. Sometimes you just need to really put your love and your energy. And so we climbed all as much as we could all the time we were all pretty good really yeah. like in the in this little group there is one of my best friends now and she's an 80 plus climber so something was something was right, right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and uh, obviously I've got heroes from this time and my biggest hero is Yuji Hayama the one I saw him win this World Cup and I think my dad is from Asia. My dad is Vietnamese. Right. So I guess I, s I immediately identified to Yuji because he was Japanese. And um, at the time, there was, well, <laughs> it's changed a lot, but at the time, there was no Asian climbers at all, not even in the semifinals. And then there was Yuji who was winning World Cups. So I did identify to his climbing, his style. He became my hero really quickly. And since then, I've been lucky enough to meet him in real life. And not just that, I can really say we've become really good friends and now we go on expedition every single year together. So in 10 years, I'm going to Japan with James and we're gonna climb with Yuji again. That's cool. Yeah. That's great. Um, so obviously you competed for a, uh, quite, a while, quite a while, didn't you? Yeah. And then what changed? Like suddenly you decided that you had enough of competing? Given that you seem to be obviously a very competitive <coughs> person at heart, or growing up anyway. And then so I did compete overall from 16 to 25. And in this time, I think it's a big amount. I did like 65 World Cups. I did like something like 15 podiums. And I think I always knew that at 20, I think I had in my head that around 25 I would be old. <laughs> <laughs> no, mainly I wanted to do something else with my life at some point yeah. because competition is really interesting. I, if I were 16, I would do it again because it pushes you to the very limit of what you can do, you know? It's like a, it's an in, inside exploration and it's, it taught me that if I really want to do something, I can just, I can do it. 
Which is, I mean, what an amazing knowledge to have, you know? Like, in terms of self-confidence, that Especially was amazing. That age, well. Yeah. But uh, 25, I think I was reaching that point. There's something about competition, and especially the way I was a competition climber. I had to, I had to hate my enemies, you know. <laughs> and the French team is very, or at least was, really pushing us in this direction of like, it's competition. You're going to war, yeah. which is pretty crazy. I think I, think I heard um, it must have been an interview with James at some point and said well, uh, something that a quote from you that um, you. Lit said that you uh, when you went to a competition that it was like you were going to kill like the competitors that's how you looked at it <laughs> I guess I, I had to be I mean it looked weird when I say these words I know at the same time obviously I was gonna but you go there to win basically yeah right? I was going there to win and, and I had there were a few competition climbers saying I just want everybody to be happy and do the best they can and I just wanted everybody else to fall so I could win <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I don't know, this is the way I got taught and I, I can handle it, this is fine, but there was a point where I realized that I wasn't a very nice person, you know? So I was, it's, it's been interesting, very, very good for my personal development, but in terms of my interaction with people, I need to change. I can't, you know, I had really good friends out of the climbing world, but I couldn't have climbing competition friends. It was not possible. So, um, so then you, how did you get into like trad climbing then? So I, I thought, when I, I thought that when I was gonna get 25 and stop competition climbing, I was gonna go back to a normal job because right. I'm a biology te teacher. I was gonna go back to a normal job, get a dog, a husband, a house, children, get old, and then and, and die. <laughs> you know, I had it in my head, you know, a normal life. And then I, I met James yeah. and I think at the time I didn't even know that a professional climber could be existing out of competition. I had no idea what was threat climbing. You know, I met James and I was like, we went to a sport crack and clearly he wasn't a really good sport climber and he told me he was a professional climber. I was like, why? And he told me I'm a threat climber. No idea what that is. Um, so I just had a really small world, you know. Yeah. Um, so I googled, I googled him, <laughs> and I immediately fell on the video of uh, Jean-Min Trintieu falling off Gaia. Yeah. You know, it's like a, it's an E8 in the Peak District that is maybe 12 meters high, and you see the climber. It like it's really intense, precise climbing, and suddenly it takes a huge fall just about misses the fall and smashes his leg against an angle yeah. and, and at that moment I decided this is mad <laughs> I, I am never gonna do that ever but somehow James and I we bumped into each other and I thought it took a while but after a while after maybe one or two years I realized if I wanted to understand James I needed to at least understand what trad climbing was about so I asked him I show me how to play strat gear and uh, explain me how to do it and the first time uh, it was on little roots in in Austria and I was placing trad gear and uh, the bolts as well and James was going behind me and giving a great uh, quality to every of my gear you know this is a 1 out of 10 or this is a 10 out of 10 in terms of like how good is the protection because the way James sees it and I think I think this is how it should be taught you know you need to be able to assess your trad gear, otherwise you're suicidal. Yeah. You know, if you're just placing gear and just hoping that you won't fall, stop climbing right now, <laughs> this is just not fine. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and then, what was that? We went to Pembroke. I was still doing loads of World Cup at that period, and James wanted to try Muy Caliente, which okay. is a, an E10, yeah. and he didn't, I, I saw that coming, you know? he. He saw Tim Emmett do it, and straight away he had it in his head to try to flash it. But I mean, in Muy Caliente, you, you take a ground fall if you fall yeah. in, a, in a section that is 8 a. So I was, first I, I was like, this is mad, James. You just, and I realized he was serious, you know? So he started to train with me. Well, he was doing maybe a quarter of my training, you know? <laughs> I could lift much more uh, iron yeah. than he could. I still can. And, <laughs> and uh, 
After six months, he went, and I thought I need to be there, you know? I kind of, if something happens and I'm not there, I, it was only maybe a year that we were together, but I just wanted to be there for him just for one week while he was going through this tough time. And I thought, while I'm there, I'm just going to try track climbing. So I went into, um, oh, I can't remember the name, an E3 in the... Uh, uh, in Pembroke, and it's a, it's only it's about six a French grade. I stayed maybe three quarters of an hour. I placed my entire rack, <laughs> and, and I finished the route. And I was like, okay, next. And so my second route was um, Point Blanc, which is an E8. <laughs> yeah, that's a bit of a step up. And it was it was it's an E8 that is run out, but really easy gear, mm -hmm. and. Um, James upsailed with me just to show me how to place the gear, you know, because I mean, this is not perfect style, but I mean, at some point you need to be realistic. I couldn't place gear, you know. So he showed me how to place the gear and the slings, and then I went for an on site, well, flash at that point uh, attempt, and uh, it's an 8 day about, so I. I was okay, and I got really, really pumped, and I was about to do it, and then I had a zip, and I took, I think I took the biggest. <laughs> fall of my life, like 15, 20 meters. And <laughs> I was so pissed when I arrived on the floor. I undid my nuts, redid, uh, pulled the ropes, redid my nuts, and then I did the roots. <laughs> like pulling all the track again, placing it back. And after that I realized, okay, more, more of that. I think what I realized was, I, what I really like about climbing is that it's a complicated thing. You know, you don't have any space to think about anything else. You have to disappear in the movement. You have to think about where to place your hands, where are the holes. And in track climbing, you multiply that because you have to think about the movements, you have to think about the track gear, which rope to use. And so, yeah, basically it's like, a, it's like as if the jigsaw was even more complex. And I really like that. You have to handle the fear. And yeah. that was, obviously this is the best part, you know, <laughs> like keeping it at bay. And uh, that was it. Yeah. So now I barely sport climb. Well, and it's all about trad. I sport climb for training, but my goals are trad. Yeah. yeah. So talking about goals, obviously. Now. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. You've just recently um, did, did the quarry run. run. Uh, yeah. You looked at that um, uh, maybe what was it? A couple of years ago or something. Yeah. You've had it. You've had your eye on it for a while, haven't you? Yeah. So, like, what happened then, and how? What was different this time? I heard about the Quarryman, I'm pretty sure I've seen the Quarryman in the magazines a long time ago, but I mean, I didn't think more about it. But I mean, everybody knows about the Quarryman. You've got this amazing daedral, and I think as soon as you see the picture and you realize how glassy like it is, yeah. everybody's like, I wonder how I would do in that, you know? It's, it's just so unusual. What, what would it be like? So two years ago, when I was uh, preparing for the Wapiti, I decided I wanted to go try the, 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 the groove pitch of the Quarryman. Because to me, it felt like it was about engagement. Even if it's bolted, it's, uh, the place is really impressive. It had a trad spirit. So I felt like it was a good mental training for, even if I didn't do it, just being in that place for the Wapiti. Like I wanted my trad kind of putting my courage together, you know, thanks to the Quarryman for the Vapiti. And at the point, I, I could do the crux pitch, I did the crux pitch, but I mean, actually the crux pitch isn't the crux pitch. <laughs> the Quarryman is a, what is it, E7, and then E8, and then a weird thing, and then another E8. It's, the Quarryman is actually pretty long. And at the time, I knew that there was maybe one day uh, I would go back, but at the same time, I was quite afraid of it. Yeah. So I think I even told myself, I won't go back. But I had excuses like, uh, yeah, the crux pitch on the top is not so pretty and um, it doesn't really make sense in terms of line. And two years went by, I did the Wapiti and I, I started to realize, these are, these are just excuses. You're afraid of the Quarryman. This is why you don't want to go back. And as soon as I realized I'm afraid of it, I realized, okay, so I have to go back in it. <laughs> and, um, and so I prepared myself for 
maybe three, four months for the quarryman. Uh, how did I do that? So I did more trad climbing again. I needed. I know the quarryman is kind of nearly not a trad route, but it still definitely has a trad spirit. Like the first pitch, you have to place a lot of trad gear, and then the balls are. <laughs> I don't know what year they are from, but you don't They're really want to fall on them. <laughs> so I. Yeah, I, uh, I prepared myself, you know, I did a lot of uh, stretching yeah. for the quarryman because I, I saw Steve McClure's video mm -hmm. and uh, I mean, his legs are yeah, always yeah. like that. And I thought I'm smaller than he, well, am I? Maybe not, actually. <laughs> I need to stretch and I, I did a lot of shoulder reinforcement with rings as well. Right. So I really, I trained specifically for the quarryman. And uh, as soon as the, actually end of March, we were in the UK going in between as soon as you had a... I did set aside two months because I knew Wales. <laughs> Wales weather is not exactly yeah. wonderful. And I knew a big part of the game would be to be patient. Um, and so I went back and it took me maybe three or four days to work all the movements again. I remember the first time. I went back in the room like, I can't do that anymore. <laughs> but actually you just need to get ready for the... It's just weird, you know, you yeah. can't, it's really hard to prepare for the Quarryman. You need, the slate is so weird, like this no friction thing. So, and little by little, I put all the movements together and, uh, and then I decided, okay, next weather window, I'm, I'm going for it. So I, uh, I only had one day of rest and then there was a win weather window and it's like, I'm too tired. My shoulders are really hurting because I tried so much the, the, the crux movement of the Quarryman. But I have to take that weather window because the, then there is like seven days of shit coming. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, whales. You don't decide. So I thought, okay, let's take this first um, attempt as just like a preparation attempt. And because I was really worried about the first pitch. It's only, I don't even know if it's E6 E6 or E7 on paper, but it's like 70 plus ish. But um, the, there is only two bolts on it. The rest is only trap things and uh, it's really precise you have to be perfect in that pitch otherwise you fall and uh, so I went and first attempt I, I, I did the first pitch straight away and actually it was fine I was like not struggling that much thinking well it's just going fine and did the second pitch obviously which is about five meters long and looks like nothing then the groove took me three tries because I kept falling and finally on my my shoulders were getting really painful. I thought, okay, this is my final try for the day and I'll have to just give up, otherwise I'll hurt myself. And <laughs> I started in that groove and as my method, I have to turn around in the groove. So I, I'm basically like a gymnast, having to let go of my feet, jamming a knee and turning around. Right. And something went a bit wrong in my method, so I, I fell. Except, so I, there was this moment where clearly I was off, except instead of falling and falling on the, on the rock, I, I jammed my ass and my legs between the diadrol, not, not on purpose, just boom. So I had like maybe 20 centimeters of fall and uh, <laughs> And I had a few minutes of like, where am I? Oh, the, so the, the, ro the rope is still under me and okay. And I, I still couldn't process anything. And it was James who was like, come on, Caroline, you can do it. Keep on going. I was like, oh yeah, back up. So, and then I finished the, the pitch, which is still, then it's a really nice diadrol, really quite tricky. And I remember pulling over and being like, I'm so glad I don't have to do that again. <laughs> <laughs> and then we had to take a long rest because the sun was coming on the last pitch. And uh, the last pitch is a 7A grade, E grade, but one movement. So I fell again three times on it and uh, I had to wait for the shade because it wasn't working. And <laughs> actually there's a video of me and I, I did it but like by the skin of my teeth. I pretty much <laughs> fell off the movement but did it. And, uh, and then arrived at the top and I was like, I just did the quarry man. And yeah, I mean, I didn't, uh, the whole preparation, I wasn't, I was never sure it was going to happen, you know, it was, it was really not easy and some, somehow it's happened to me on the Wapiti again. I did manage to put myself in a mental state that was like really unusual 
I knew that because one week after I went back in the route for pictures and I took like three falls everywhere right. and this like movement I was fighting so much again to do the to do the, the, the movements and I knew like the pitch one it wasn't easy the pitch one I just did it perfectly when I tried it yeah. so when you like if you like that fall you had how do you then get your head game back in because like you, you even said like you, you're like oh fall that's that like to just I be like right I can keep going like to obviously your head's in a different place for a second so that was that was a really extreme one I think this kind of I'm calling it a fall but it wasn't a fall clearly like an extreme weirdly unusual movement um, I didn't. I wasn't prepared, and it surprised me. But uh, I, I've learned from competition climbing to be ready for surprises. Right. I even, I even used to. Uh, I, w I did visualize in my uh, when I was preparing for the let's say finals. I would have one go in my head, visualizing what could go wrong. Let's say I could have a foot zipping here, or this hold could be completely different from what I thought, or this place I thought it's a rest maybe it's not a rest at all and so I will be surprised and I'll have to like get back in it so this is exactly what I did you know I got surprised but I got back in it I think it's just a maybe it's just this simple concept of don't expect things to go smoothly because they won't and it is fine you don't have to be perfect to do your your route you just have to keep on trying yeah um, cool, brilliant. I think that's pretty much everything covered. Thank you so much well, for speaking with us today. Sorry, there was a lot of me talking. But no, no, it was very interesting, very insightful. Thank you very much.